Livestream family, it's good to be with you today. Welcome to our Sunday worship gathering. Um, I'm just, I just really miss you guys. Um, I, I'm so glad that we can at least gather and have this platform to worship. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all staying safe. Uh, here's what we're going to do to get things started in our worship today. Uh, we're going to do catechism. I'm going to read a verse. I'll ask you a question, and if you can respond with the answer that we'll post on the screen for you. This is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 3. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Livestream, here's the question. What does God require in the fourth and fifth commandments? Fourth, that on the Sabbath day we spend time in public and private worship of God, rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. Fifth, that we love and honor our father and our mother, submitting to their godly discipline and direction. Pray with me. Father God, you are the giver of life. We only flourish when we walk in your ways. That is who we are as your people. You have created us. And as our creator, you tell us that we need rest. So help us to keep us from justifying ourselves through ceaseless work. Give us the humility to be able to honor our parents. May we always live by your commands rather than by our own instincts. God, help us in this way. Lead us in the worship today. And in Christ's name we pray, amen.
today to worship the one who loves us and the one who died and resurrected from the grave. Jesus, that is you. Sin created a wall so that we could not have fellowship with you, so that we could not be in your presence. 
but by your power, you broke them down. You broke our chains, and you became and are the light in the darkness. Death cannot hold you down, and even now, sin and darkness are afraid of you, Jesus. Today, we want to thank you for loving us constantly every single day. Use this time for your glory because it belongs to you. And in your name we pray, amen. Livestream family, welcome again. It's good to worship with you today. If you are new or you're visiting us for the first time here on our virtual platform of worship, I want to welcome you. Uh, I don't see you, obviously, but you see me, and hopefully we can uh, meet and chat and, and we can get to know each other a little bit one, one of these days. Um, we have a, a few announcements, just a couple, and then we're going to get into the scripture reading, and then we'll get into the preaching of the word. Um, I just wanted to uh, chat with you a little bit about, uh, just kind of give you an update of what's happening here with uh, live stream. Um, we're, uh, we don't know, honestly, how long we're going to have to do these virtual services. Um, I, I thought that we would be able to gather by now, but just it's just not going the way we want it to, and it's no one's fault. It's just the, the, obviously the, the reality and, and, and the condition that we're in because of COVID. And so safety is our number one concern, and so we don't want to gather until we feel like uh, we're ready and we're comfortable and we can confidently go forward with that. But until then, uh, we're just going to have to keep pushing forward with these virtual services. So here's what that means. Uh, first, I, I've been kind of mentioning this a little bit uh, previously, but if you have a trusted social circle, circle, if you have a group of people in your life where you can be comfortable uh, being around physically, and they happen to go to live stream, or maybe if they, even if they don't go to live stream, um, I want to encourage you to gather with those small social circles on Sundays for the corporate worship. You obviously do not have to do that. Uh, I want you to be comfortable and safe in whatever context of worship that you're in. But if you do feel comfortable, and these are people that you can hang out with and, 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 and you can trust them in the decisions that they're making with their lifestyles, I want to encourage you to reach out to them, gather in those small circles, and, and worship. Uh, uh, worship together, sing together, submit to the word together. Um, that's obviously not the most ideal way to do Sunday corporate worship, but it is so much better than worshiping by yourself. Um, and so obviously, again, you do not have to do that, but I just want to encourage you to think about that. Um, second, um, after our service today, uh, members at Livestream will be receiving an email that will include a link for a poll. Now, this poll is going to be super quick. Um, it'll take less than 10 seconds, literally. I mean, unless you just want to dwell on these simple questions. It's just going to be really, really quick. Um, and here's what's going to happen. Um, since we don't know how long these virtual services are going to go for, we might change our Sunday service time for the time being. So you're going to have in this poll three choices for service times. Uh, it'll either be like you get to choose one choice or you get to rank them. I'm not sure how it's going to play out just yet. But the uh, service times that we might change to is either going to be 9.30 a.m. on Sundays or 11.30 a.m. or we will just keep it uh, the same time at 1.15. So uh, this basically means that uh, we're just going to post it earlier on YouTube. It doesn't change so many things so much. Obviously, uh, things have changed. Your schedules have changed. Your work situations have changed. So many things have changed in the past seven, eight months. And so I realize that not everyone is gathering at 115 to worship. And so um, by doing it this way, then at least uh, you get uh, more of the day to be able to plan ahead and, and do your Sunday worship online. Now, um, uh, the issue then, the reason why we're doing this then is because we want to encourage you starting today uh, to join the virtual worship through Zoom once a month for Communion Sunday. So Communion Sunday is the second Sunday of every month, and I want to encourage you to do your best just for that Sunday to gather with us on Zoom so that we can worship together. This is not mandatory. Uh, this is just something that I want to encourage you to do. It would just be really cool to see you guys uh, at least on a screen through zoom or whatever it is to be able to chat a little bit to be able to just get a sense that we are worshiping jesus together 
Um, and so that's what the poll is for. Um, I just want to be clear, this is only a poll. This is not a vote. There will be no electoral college. These polls will just help us be informed about where you are and what you prefer. That's all it is. There will be no recount. Okay, I don't, maybe I'm, maybe it's too soon for me to be making those jokes, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, this is just to help us understand where you are. Um, so that's that. Um, speaking of polls, uh, just something I want to share. Uh, let's pray for these elections. Today is Sunday. Uh, when you're watching this today, this is Sunday, but as I'm recording this, it's Wednesday afternoon, and so at this point for me and for the couple of us who are in this physical room right now, we don't know what the elections are going to, how the elections are going to play out, and so um, I just want to encourage you um, to pray right now for our country, to pray for our leadership, to pray for our people. Uh, we need to be people praying for a united pursuit of peace and equality. And let's pray that the church would be a beacon of light in this crazy time. Anxiety levels are up. People are nervous. People are on edge. And so let's be in prayer. And that might even be you. Maybe you're just not in a good place in your mental and emotional health. Um, but let's be challenged to pursue God and to trust that he is sovereign, that he is king. Um, so I want to encourage you to pray for that. Thanks for hanging with me in the announcements. I'm going to get into the scripture reading. We're in the book of 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to read the first four verses, and then I'm going to jump to verse 10. This is 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, and this is God's word. When David's time to, to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the courage, keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Verse 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. This is God's word. <clears throat> A few years back, my grandmother had uh, passed away and... Um, and shortly before she passed, what had happened is she was uh, in her home and she slipped and fell on the kitchen floor. And, um, you know, and for a lot of elderly people, once they kind of sustain that injury, that leads to other kind of complications. And so, um, and things just kind of went south from there. And so uh, she ended up at the La Palma Hospital and, um, and my family um, were kind of gearing up to go visit her. And my mother tells me, your grandma is in a very... Uh, poor state she's in bed she's weak and she might not be able to say much and that was just my mother's way of mentally pre preparing me for what I'm about to see um, and I've never seen my grandma so frail and so she's preparing me to go and so I walk into the hospital and I'm cool and I'm composed and um, and man right when I saw her on that hospital bed I broke down I mean she just had all kinds of tubes running in and through her and, and she was in the weakest and most frail condition I've ever seen her and so I had to step out of the room because I just I just lost it um, and so a couple of minutes later I was able to compose myself um, and and kind of gather myself together and so I stepped back into the room and 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 there I see her and um, she's in the hospital bed and she can barely move and she can barely say anything and so I got really close to her and I'm thinking maybe this might be the last time I'm ever going to have a conversation with my grandmother because I just don't know what's going to happen at this point and I can tell she's gathering her strength to say a few words to me she's doing her best to sit up we're telling her just rest it's okay and so she musters up the strength to say something and so I I lean in close to her and then this is what she says she says <laughs> which in Korean means, did you eat? 
And I'm thinking, Grandma, you're about to cross over to the other side and you're concerned if I had lunch? Like, you're crazy. Like, I love you, but you're crazy. Did you eat? I mean, who cares about me? Like, you're the one in the hospital bed. And so I start tearing up again. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's all she's concerned about at this moment. And, and it was just so hard to hear. But, but, but man, she, she passed and, and I believe she's with Jesus now. And so all things considered, you know, praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear that. But the, those were the, some of the last words she's ever said to me. If I can look back on the entirety of, of the years I've known my grandmother, I can write a book with all the things she said to me. Um, all the times that she would walk me home from school, all the times she would tell me to do my homework, all the times she would tell me to eat, all the times she would tell me to stop eating, like so many things I remember she would tell me. And, but in a weird way, those last words on her hospital bed is what's going to stick out to me the most. Because those last words captured the kind of woman she was, which I know sounds silly. But what I mean is, she always put the practical needs of others before herself. And her saying that to me, in, in, in a short little question, really boils down the kind of woman she really was. You see, many times, someone's last words capture their legacy. Many times, it's the last words of a dying person that show who they really were and what kind of life they lived. You see, we're in our last week in the life of King David. And the same is true for King David. The end of David's life doesn't just conclude his story, but it leaves for us a legacy. David is old, He's come to the end of his life. He wants to pass on the leadership to his son Solomon. And these are the words, the last words of King David. And the last words capture his legacy. These last words show us who he really was and what kind of life he lived. So here's what we're going to see in David's last words. It's an exhortation to his son Solomon, who will be Israel's next king. And this exhortation can be broken down into three parts. First, be strong. Second, take your calling seriously. And third, be centered on God's word. So first, let's look at the first exhortation. David says to Solomon, be strong. In verse 2, he writes, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. One of the principles that we have to adhere to whenever we read Scripture is that no matter what, we are prone to view the Bible with a certain lens. Uh, when we compare modern reading and modern thinking to these ancient writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we've got to understand that there are years and layers and layers and layers that separate us uh, from their worldview and from what they're writing from. And so it's irresponsible for us to read Scripture wherever we are and to just inject our own interpretation into that and expect, well, that's what it means. Now, that's all of us, no matter what, because we all come from a different mindset compared to these readers. So does that mean that we just kind of give up and say, what's the point of reading the Bible then? No, of course not. But we have reliable ways from which we can interpret the Bible rightly. You see, if, we, if you've been with me for some time, then I'm sure this is going to be familiar to you. But one of the things we use to, uh, to rightly interpret is context. Context is a sure clue as to how we can understand rightly what these biblical authors are saying. So here's what I mean. With no contextual examination, if all you do is take this as be a man, like, if that's all you take from this, and you immediately inject your own modern understanding of what it means to be a man, then the modern lens we use could be something like this. The more money you make, the more manly you are. The more muscles you have, the more manly you are. The more stoic you are, the more manly you are. The more girls you've dated, 
the more manly you are. The more beer and soju and shots you can take, the more manly you are. And then here's the Christian take on that. The more theology you know, the more manly you are. But when we look at the biblical idea of manhood, there are more important and fundamental aspects of strength and manhood. In fact, as soon as you read, only be strong, what does that remind you of? What do you immediately think of when there's this theme of leadership being passed on and King David to his son Solomon is saying, be strong. That immediately reminds me of Joshua. And and I don't think that's a coincidence. God gives this charge to Joshua multiple times. And every time I read that in Joshua 1, man, it just gets me fired up. And so when God gives that charge to Joshua, it's never simply be a man. Have more muscles. Drink more alcohol. Date more girls. Make more money. Do you really think that that is what God is saying to Joshua when he says be strong? No, of course not. But the charge is almost always saturated in God and His Word. That's what God is saying. It's not simply be strong and be courageous, but it's be strong and be courageous. Why? Because God is with you. Be strong and be courageous because you can center yourself in God's Word. So when we take that charge, that biblical charge to to, to be strong. It completely changes how we view strength and it completely changes how we view manhood and womanhood. I mean, let's be real here. Making money, being buff, drinking beer in moderation, of course, like there's nothing wrong with these things, but these aren't the things that make you a man or a woman. In God's eyes, strength and manhood are defined by character. In God's eyes, strength and manhood are defined by character. Look at the most faithful men and women in the Bible. Yes, they had their typical manhood and maybe their womanhood stuff, but their their identity was defined by their pursuit to love and obey God. So that now begs the question, well, what does it mean to be strong? How do we define strength? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Verse 2, David says, I am about to go all the way of the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And then in verse 3, he says, And keep the charge of the Lord your God. In other words, take your calling seriously. What we're seeing here is, it's a really awesome thing because King David is, is passing on the leadership of kingship to his son Solomon. And I love seeing that dynamic at work here because David isn't giving this vague and and just kind of this random exhortation, but what he's doing is is he's speaking from years and years of leadership experience. Through his ups and downs, through his successes and failures, David, in in his last words, he's boiling down all the years of experience of leadership He's boiling it down and he's giving it to his son Solomon. And and we spent the past weeks unpacking that and really exploring and examining examining the life of King David. And so this is what we've seen from the life of King David. David is a young shepherd boy who was called to be Israel's next king after Saul. David defeated Goliath. We saw David's close relationship with his friend Jonathan. Jonathan. We talked about Uzzah's death because he touched the ark of God. God made a covenant with David that he's going to establish the throne. And then after his life being threatened and after experiencing all that betrayal and the dangers and the drama, we come to find out that God was using all that to prepare him for seasons of success and victory. And then we see King David falling into sin. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and he murdered Uriah. And then last week we talked about the consequences of his sin and the rippling effect it has over his family and relationships. That's a lot of stuff for one man's kingship. That's not even the entirety of his life. That's just his reign as king. You see, David started his kingship when he was 30 years old, which is crazy if you think about it 
If you're in your 20s, or maybe some of you, maybe you're, you're, you're still under the age of 20, you, you, in your head, you look at the age 30 and you think, yeah, that's old. There's just something about the age 30 that makes you old. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. Let me tell you something. When you reach 30, you're not going to be as old as you think. Things change, but not everything. Because imagine being the king over an entire nation, being 30 years old. If you are 25 years old, that's five years from now. So being 30, yeah, it might have this aspect of being old, but it's really not that old when you consider the kind of responsibility and weight that you have on your shoulders. So imagine being a king over a nation as a 30-year-old man. And now as we read this text, David is now 70 years old at this point, and he's about to die. He says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. That's a figure of speech. That's him saying, uh, I'm going to do everything that in this world and everything that in creation is going to eventually do. Die. That's what he's saying. And a lot of you are probably thinking, well, that's really young to die. 70 isn't, isn't a young age, of course, but it's young enough to die. And the cool thing about that is when you look at King David's life is that you see the bigger narrative you see on a macro level the ups and downs and the failures and successes of his life. But then it's different because imagine living 40 years in, as an average Joe. I'm not trying to be offensive or anything, but just as an average Joe. You have a job, you have a family, you go to church, you do annual family vacations. You know, 40 years of that. Now imagine 40 years as a king. We're talking very, very different lifestyles. People are trying to kill you. You're running away and living in caves. You've murdered someone. Your own family betrays you. That's a very different 40 years to live. So why am I saying all that? Being King David for 40 years is more than most of us living for 100 years. So we have to appreciate the depth of David's exhortation to Solomon. It's that 40 years and then some, and he's boiling it down. He's saying to Solomon, be strong and take your calling seriously. If anyone knows the ups and downs to be the king of Israel, it is David, and he's passing that on to his son Solomon. After 40 years of being king, he's saying, keep the charge of the Lord your God. Take God's calling in your life seriously. Be committed to what God has called you to. Be willing to take risks for it. Be passionate about your calling. Be sharpened in it. Don't grow stagnant in it. Don't just live your life just to pass time and just let days and weeks and seasons roll by, but take your life intentionally to love and obey God and to have a razor-sharp focus as to where God is leading you. Church, in the same way God has called you, you don't have to be the king of Israel to understand that God has given you a calling. Do you know what your calling is? Do you know what your calling is? And I know that almost all of you, if not all of you, if you're a Christian, you've asked that question. I can almost guarantee at some point in your life, you had to have asked that question. What is God's will for my life? What is God calling me to do? See, most of you, you're at an age where you're struggling to find a job, especially in this weird quarantine season that we're in and what happens typically, what I've seen over and over and over, and people are in their mid-20s getting into the 30s, what happens is they struggle to find a job. They get really worried. They share about it in their small groups. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to build my career? And then what happens? You finally find a job, and then you're like, OMG, thank the Lord. You're so grateful. You're just exuding with thanksgiving. You, you give the first fruits of your paycheck to the offering because you're so excited and thankful to God. And then 1.5 years later, what happens? You're looking at your nine to five. You're like, what the heck am I doing with my life? What am I doing here? There's no joy. There's no life. There's no purpose into what I'm doing. You see, when you ask that question, that's a good sign. Because that means something in you is recognizing the fact that you are built for something greater. That you have a calling in life that's not defined by the paycheck you make. It's not defined by how much you can put in your investments. 
It's not defined by you being able to pay for the meal for all your friends when you go out. It's not defined by those things. It is defined by kingdom life. Fundamentally speaking, you are different from your non-Christian co-workers and classmates. As a Christian, you have a spiritual calling, which is just a nice way of saying God has called you to kingdom life. So my question is, in your years as a college student, in your years as a young adult, you must have figured out something about God's calling. Like, you don't have to have the next 40 years of your life figured out, but you must have figured out right now that this is where God wants you to be. You see, after all these years of being king, David isn't just telling Solomon to take his calling as king seriously, but he's saying, take your kingdom life seriously. Being a king is just how you work it out. But it's not defined by you being a king. It's defined by the spiritual calling that God has given you. You don't have to be a pastor to live a kingdom life. Live a kingdom life as a teacher. Live a kingdom life working in finance or working in corporate. Live a kingdom life as a musician. Live a kingdom life as an administrative assistant. Live a kingdom life as a man or a woman. Live a kingdom life as a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter. Whatever God has called you to right now, take your calling seriously. Maybe the issue for some of you as you think about this question is that, well, maybe it's not that Maybe it's you want to take the calling seriously, but maybe God just hasn't given you that calling clearly. Maybe you're at a point, you're a season in life where you're just kind of bouncing around things. You're not quite sure what you're passionate about, either because you have no passions or, or you have too many passions. Um, or, and maybe you're just like too good at everything and you don't know what to choose and, and you don't know what it is. I think I might have uh, 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 shared this before, but I I received my calling to go into pastoral ministry my second year in college. I was 19 years old. I grew up in the church, but I didn't accept Jesus until I was 15 years old. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but, but growing up in the church, as I look back in retrospect, God... I believe was exposing me to things he was nudging at my heart my whole life to get into pastoral ministry even before I was a Christian I would go to service on Sundays as a kid and and I hated it the only thing Sunday service to me was I can go see my friends and we could talk about baseball cards and that was the highlight of my Sunday like I hated it Sunday service was boring and it was kitty I remember being like an eight-year-old child and I'm like this is so kitty. Like, this is so immature. And I'm saying that as a child, which doesn't make sense. And, and so I hated going to church. And as a child, one thing that was different that I never, that I was too prideful to admit was I would look at my pastors. Some were fobby. Some were young. Some were old. Some were cool. Some were like stuck up. But whatever kind of pastors they were, one thing that they all, all had in common was that they just exuded a love for Jesus. And I knew that because they cared for me and they cared for all these other snot-nosed, spoiled, obnoxious little kids. They always had a big smile on their face. They always just portrayed the steadfastness and this love. And even as a child, you know what I was thinking? I would look at these pastors and I would think, I know y'all aren't getting good paychecks. Why are you so happy? As an eight-year-old kid, that's what I was thinking. I didn't know it at the time, but God was using these Jesus-loving men and these, G- and these Jesus-loving women to expose me to the joys of pastoral ministry. And it was God molding me, shaping me, and exposing me to leading me to a point where my second year in college, I'm sitting in a youth service as a youth Bible study teacher listening to a youth sermon about taking spiritual risks and something just clicked. And what I realized was that it's not that God wasn't making it unclear, is that I was scared. I was making fear bigger than God. The issue wasn't, what is God calling me to? The issue was, why am I making fear bigger than God? 
You see, here's my point. If you're not sure what your calling is, and that's why it's hard for you to take your calling seriously, maybe the issue isn't God, maybe the issue is you. Could it be that you're making fear bigger than God? Or maybe you're making your need for financial security or whatever else it is, maybe you're making that bigger than your need for God. Church, if you seek out God, I mean, you genuinely, wholeheartedly seek out God, why would God not clarify his calling for you? If God is calling you to a kingdom life, whatever that looks like, his desire is to show you. And just to be honest with you, when you seek it out and God shows you and God crystallizes what his calling is for you, there's nothing more exciting in this life. It fuels you, it excites you, it gets you up in the morning. So that begs another question. Well, then how do I seek out God? Verse 2, David says, be strong and show yourself a man. Verse 3, he says, keep the charge of the Lord your God. So he's saying, Be strong, he's saying, take your call seriously. And then he says, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. In other words, David is saying to Solomon, as he's passing on the leadership, be centered on God's word. The truth is that everyone is centered on something. Everyone has a set of laws that they follow. I know we all like to think that we're unique, that nobody has control over me. I'm my own person, and I'm individualistic. Like, we want to be these free thinkers. We want to be creative. We don't want to be controlled by anyone, which to a very large extent, it's true. But the truth is, we are, at the same time, very complex people. We're multi-layered. And what I mean is that as God's workmanship, we're all very unique We're created with different personalities and strengths and weaknesses, but at the same time, there's something innate in all of us in that we operate by a set of rules. So you got to understand me when I'm saying, what are you, what is your set of rules? What is, what is the content from which it directs and regulates and dictates what you do in your life? What are these set of rules that shape your values and informs your decisions? See, if you're going to be really, really honest with yourself, there are things you can do to really see what your set of rules are. For example, you might have heard something like this, you can't argue with stats. You might have heard something like this, numbers don't lie. We do this all the time with athletes. How many rings does this guy have? How many triple doubles does he have? How many uh, home runs does he have in a season? What's this pitcher's ERA? Like these are the numbers and these numbers don't lie. In the crazy political climate that we're in, a lot of us are trying to get hardcore facts. It's this ongoing process of figuring out what is noise and what is actually true. We don't want, we just want no fuss, just kind of no lie. Just give me the hardcore fact. Just give me the numbers. So in the same way, look at your stats. Take a good, honest, sobering look at your life and look at your numbers. What do I mean? Your bank statement. Numbers don't lie. Look at your bank statement. In part, that contributes to the set of rules that you follow. How many hours a day do you spend entertaining yourself as opposed to growing yourself? What are you thinking about the moment you wake up and the moment you sleep? What makes you happy? What angers you? You see, none of these things single-handedly will tell you what's going on in your heart, but when you add it all up, it's hard to argue against because numbers don't lie. So once you get an idea of what set of rules you're following, you can be very honest with yourself and be honest with God And then you can see, now how do I get myself one step towards making God's word more centered? How how does this measure up? How do I compare? How do your stats align with God's stats? In other words, how much do your numbers align with God's numbers? Like, is what makes you happy the things that God makes happy, the things that makes God happy? 
do you get angry about the same things that God gets angry with? When you invest your time in God's word, what you are doing is you are partnering with the Holy Spirit. You're giving the Holy Spirit permission to go to work on your heart. You're giving the Holy Spirit permission to do something to your mind, to shape, to turn, to tweak, to transform the very way you think and the very things that you value. You're inviting God into that place where no one else is allowed in and you can slowly allow kingdom values to shape you. You see, that's the power of God's word. And that's why David is saying to Solomon, take God's word seriously. Make it centered in your life. So in David's last words to his son Solomon, he gives three exhortations. Be strong. Take your calling seriously. Be centered on God's word. The end of David's life doesn't just conclude with this story, but it leaves for us a legacy. David is old. He's come to the end of his life. He wants to pass on the leadership to his son Solomon. And these are the last words of King David. And these last words capture his legacy. These last words show us who he really was and what kind of life he lived. And I've been saying this over and over in the series that we're in. When we look at King David, we're led to fix our gaze on Jesus. If we want a model of strength, someone with character and integrity, someone who stands for truth and for what is good and pure, we fix our gaze on Jesus. When we need a model of someone who took their calling with the utmost commitment, we fix our gaze on Jesus. Every work, every miracle, every encounter, every prayer was filled with the utmost purpose and intention, and he was committed to his calling to go to the cross and die for the sins of humanity. And if there was anyone who grounded himself in the word of God, it was Jesus. He didn't just obey the word of God, but he himself was the word of God, the logos, the exact representation of God. And what that tells us is that if we love Jesus, then we will love God's word. And if we obey Jesus, then we will obey God's word. The point of the scriptures is to point us to Jesus. The life of King David is a valuable story for us as believers because we see his life. We see his ups and downs. We see his seasons of victory and his seasons of downfall. We see his passion for God, but we also see his sin. This tells us that even the greatest kings and leaders of this world are deeply fall, flawed. But when we look at King David, we're led to fix our gaze on Jesus. Jesus is our hope because Jesus is our king. Pray with me. Lord, how good it is to look at the life of King David, to see his last words, and to know that you are still sovereign that we look at everything that happened in King David's life, that you are steering, that you are in control, that you are doing something in your people. Lord, as we think and, and examine the scriptures and look at what you're doing in King David's life, may it point us and may it push us to love Jesus, to find strength in Jesus, to find our calling in Jesus, to look at Jesus and to obey his word. So help us in our time of need. Help us to apply this to our lives. Lord, we thank you for being our king, for being our hope. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. Right now we're gonna get into a time of communion and I just want to briefly let you know um, some, uh, a few pivotal things of what we believe about communion. First, communion does not save you. This is uh, a physical reminder of a spiritual and inward reality. Which is, that, uh, which is the gospel, uh, that Jesus died for our sins and resurrected and we are made one with him. What we believe as a church also is that the bread and wine are not the actual flesh and blood of Jesus, but they represent his flesh and blood. And third, uh, I want to say this um, in a loving and respectful way. If you are not a believer, I want to ask that you refrain from this practice. We believe that Jesus has mandated this for the church 
uh, the believers. And so we ask that you just uh, observe uh, and see what God is doing in his people here and now. So we'll get into a time of communion now. Livestream, we're going to get into a time of communion now. Uh, I want to invite you to participate in this sacrament that Jesus himself has given to his disciples and the church. And this is an invitation to those of you who genuinely confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you strive to live in accordance to his word. And so uh, let's do this with uh, a prayerfulness. Let's do this with a focus and intention to obey Jesus, to be united with his people um, as we participate in this. Uh, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, how good it is that you invite us to your table and that we are not just eating and drinking, but Lord, we are taking in you. This here, the bread, it, it shows us, it reminds us, and it points us to you, our need for you, God. It shows us and it reminds us the brokenness of your body on the cross. And God, we need that. So bless this bread which represents your flesh. And Lord, we thank you for, for this, God, your blood. Uh, this juice, this wine, it represents your blood and it shows us, it points to us of what you shed on the cross on our behalf. Lord, use this in a way that we are communing with you in love and fellowship. And so we thank you for this, this practice, this holy practice you've given to us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Church, when you're ready, I want to invite you to go ahead and eat the bread given to you and to drink the wine given to you. And uh, the wonderful thing about this uh, vir virtual communion gathering is that you can go ahead and press pause on your own and you could take your own time to pray, to focus, to worship. Uh, that is something that you can do. And when you're ready, go ahead and press play and you can join me um, together as I eat the bread and drink, and drink the juice and do this in obedience to what Jesus called us to do. Thank you, church, for uh, joining with us in this practice of communion. Uh, I'm going to close out the communion with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us such a clear picture of your sacrifice. This is a powerful reminder for us that we need your death, we need your resurrection. And Lord, this practice 
draws us to you as it draws us to one another. So help us to be reminded, Lord, that none of us here is deserving to be at your table. But we are here because of your grace, because of your sacrifice. So help us to live in victory over death in our lives. Help us to live in communion with you every day. Help us to take our calling as disciples with conviction, with seriousness, and with commitment. Help us to live in joy over the deep sacrifice you have given to us. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This will now end communion.
here to remember you, to remember what you did on that cross for us, sacrificing your life so that we can experience eternal life with you. Jesus, we don't deserve to have you. We don't deserve to have fellowship with you. But it is because of your grace and your love that we are allowed to come to your table far and wide, no matter who we are, no matter what sins we have committed, that you welcome us to your table to dine with you. And so Jesus, as we take this communion, let us not take it thinking that this is just bread and wine, but let us really see that this is a symbol that you are a part of us. And Jesus, let this remind us to never lose our wonder of the cross and what it took for you to do that. Jesus, we love you, and in your name we pray, amen. Church, thank you so much for joining me with, um, in me in communion. Right now, we're going to get into a time of offering. And so I want to invite you to right now, go ahead. Let's give with joy. Let's give with gladness now. Right now, uh, someone from our membership will close the offering with prayer, and then I will close out the service with the benediction. Okay, let's pray. Uh, thank you, God, just for blessing another week. And even through all this craziness, I pray that um, the community just has been thriving still and has been staying healthy. Um, I pray that we can continue to stay in the Word and just hope that everyone is doing okay. In Jesus' name I pray. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week, church.